Hi, my name is Jerry Anderson. Welcome to this introduction to BizTalk Server 2010. This course will focus on the aspects of BizTalk that will be of interest to developers. Now, if you will be working with BizTalk Server in an admin role, you might be interested in the course that is offered in parallel with this one. And that course is called Deploying and Managing Business Processes and Integration Solutions Using Microsoft BizTalk Server 2010. If you're new to BizTalk development, I extend a second welcome to you. BizTalk is a great product. You'll encounter a learning curve, but that's what this course is designed to address. And if you've been working with BizTalk for a while, hopefully this course will help you fill in some gaps and maybe answer some of the lingering questions that you might have. Looking from the perspective of a developer, I think you'll find that BizTalk covers a lot of territory. And it ultimately has to because the problem domain that it addresses is pervasive and integrating systems is hard. But based on my experience, BizTalk does its job well. I started working with BizTalk in 2004, and I've got to say that my respect for it has only grown since then. And a lot of that stems from earlier experience with implementing messaging systems for B2B integrations. I was working with a small team of developers at the time, and we took on some big challenges. And we developed some pretty nice stuff, and it worked well. But when BizTalk Server 2004 came out, it had us beat in every category. Now when I think back to those earlier days, and I try to imagine what we could have accomplished with the same amount of time and resources, but with BizTalk serving as a foundation for our development, I can only wonder. In this module, we're going to take a look at BizTalk Server from the ground up. We're going to start off by answering some of the fundamental questions that most people have when they first encounter BizTalk. We'll talk about the role that BizTalk plays in the enterprise, and we'll talk about the services and tools that it offers to fulfill that role. After that, we'll take a look at some of the new capabilities that come in the box with BizTalk Server 2010. We'll talk about some of the new improvements in the tools. We'll talk about some of the new improvements in the adapters. And then we'll finish up by taking a look at the developer tools that BizTalk Server offers. They integrate very nicely within the Visual Studio development environment. And in particular, there have been some very nice improvements in the mapper for BizTalk Server 2010. And then during the lab, you'll have a chance to take a look at the tools for, on your own and examine a BizTalk application to see what the pieces look like. BizTalk Server offers so many services and tools that it's easy to get lost when you're seeing it for the first time. So I'll start off by answering some of the fundamental questions you might have about BizTalk. What is it? What comes with it? What's it good for? What kind of problems can it solve? Where does it fit within my enterprise? We'll talk about how it addresses some of the common complaints that people have when they're trying to integrate systems. We'll talk about how it can help you when you need to integrate systems within your own enterprise. And we'll talk about how BizTalk can help you when you need to integrate with systems outside of your enterprise. And after that, I'll show you how the components of BizTalk work together to make that possible. And then I'll describe how BizTalk addresses the needs of different job roles. Business analysts obviously have different needs than developers, and developers obviously have different needs than administrators. And BizTalk offers particular services and features to address each of those needs. And then finally, with BizTalk Server 2010, there are four different editions available. There is an enterprise, a standard, a branch, and a developer edition. And I'll describe the differences between each of those. So if you're seeing BizTalk for the first time, you're probably wondering, what is this thing and how can it help me do my job? Well, I would like to answer that question by walking through a simple integration scenario and then talking about what it takes to implement that. So suppose your business is doing business with another company and you have an application that needs to send data over to that other company. 
And so you develop that integration. You write the code that it takes to establish an internet connection to the other company to send the data over. And that works out so well that you get asked to integrate a couple of more applications. Well, you can see where this is going. Right now, you're just integrating these applications between two different companies, and it can start to get overwhelming just at that point. Now, imagine as you start trying to integrate with company C, D, E, and F, uh, this is going to start growing pretty complex. Well, this isn't sounding so great, so what's going to happen next? Well, this is where BizTalk Server can start helping you out. If you integrate with the first application using BizTalk Server, there's a pretty decent chance that you can reuse some of those integration components to integrate your other applications. All right, you say, sounds great. Well, what does BizTalk Server have to offer? Well, one of the big things that BizTalk Server offers is a messaging and an orchestration environment. It provides a set of components that you can use to establish communication connections with other companies, and it can track all of that communication so you can see if everything is flowing through as expected or if any of the messages that are passing back and forth are failing. And its orchestration capabilities allow it to coordinate long-term conversations between those systems possible that your three applications might need to coordinate with each other while they're completing a business process with a system at company B. This talk orchestration can help coordinate the conversations between all of those different systems. Now, integration code can be notoriously difficult to write. So BizTalk Server helps you out there. It provides a suite of tools that help expedite the common tasks that you'll encounter when you're writing integration code. As these applications are working out this business process, there will of course be some business rules that need to be enforced. So to fulfill that need, BizTalk offers a business rule framework that helps you create and manage sets of rules that govern business processes. You will obviously need to know if message traffic is passing back and forth successfully, so that's built into the BizTalk server environment. And it's quite likely that one or more of your applications will prefer to communicate via web services. So BizTalk has very rich support for web service integration. And so obviously you're going to need to provide some sort of business reporting capability for the transactions that are passing back and forth between your companies. And so BizTalk offers something called business activity monitoring. And business activity monitoring will allow a business analyst to go in at any point and see exactly what's going on inside BizTalk Server from a business perspective. And finally, as you start integrating with other companies, BizTalk can help you there as well. It offers support for trading partner integration. BizTalk will help you manage the information that you need to connect to the systems at these other companies. So you might say, okay, great, that sounds like a nice set of technical features. But is BizTalk Server really the way to go in the long run? Is it really going to help me and my organization get our job done? All right, well, let's take a step back then and take a look at some of the problems that crop up when you start talking about integrating applications. So one of the big problems that comes up right away when you start integrating different systems is that each system presents its own set of challenges. So if you've been able to get two systems to work together and you add a third to the mix, that third system might speak a completely different network protocol. It might expect its data to be in a completely different format, perhaps a format that the other two don't produce. And if those systems are going to communicate directly with one another, then you have to solve those problems multiple times. As you keep adding new systems, you're eventually going to reach the point where you just don't have the resources that you need to keep solving those problems. Without a common platform for all of these integrations, the complexity can grow overwhelming very quickly. Speaking of complexity, if those integration components are scattered across many different platforms and systems, the deployment and maintenance of those components can really become unbearable. Now, those are all very real concerns, but let's put those aside for a second and just say, okay, we've got all that. We've somehow handled all, all of that. We have our integrations up and running. We're going to try to stay with what we have. Well, another challenge that always comes along with system integration is reporting. 
And if one system knows something about a business process and another system knows another piece of the business process, it can really be difficult to pull all of that data together to make a coherent report. What you often end up with is multiple reports, each reporting part of the data, and then when you try to reconcile those, they don't always agree. So then you get to answer the question, well, which system has the right answer? And then as time passes, systems change, requirements change, business processes change, and you'll need to make modifications. And sometimes that's not any easier than the initial development. In particular, when you start thinking about the fact that you might have to make that change multiple times, since a particular system might be supporting multiple integrations. It's also all too common that one person ends up being responsible for one particular integration. And hopefully that person's available when the time comes to make modifications. So then if you end up in a situation where different people are responsible for different integrations, well, then it's going to be very hard to define a set of procedures. And that's going to obviously make it very difficult for an operations team to be able to support that environment. Now, another thing that you may encounter is that it can be very difficult to track the activity of an integration. If data isn't getting through, was it the sender that was having trouble communicating, or was it the receiving system that wasn't able to receive? Where did things go wrong? How long did this problem last? When did it start? When did it end? What happened to all of the data that was supposed to be transmitted? Those types of problems need to be addressed in the foundation of any sort of integration. And then things only grow more complex as you start integrating with systems outside of your own environment. Integrating with systems at a trading partner obviously is going to increase the challenges, especially if we need to start thinking about service level agreements and so forth. Okay, well, let's take a look at a common enterprise integration scenario and see how BizTalk Server can address those. So in this scenario, we have an inventory application running on a mainframe. And so this system checks stock periodically to see if any items have fallen below acceptable inventory levels. And when it finds that's the case, it needs to submit a request that that item be placed on order. Well, in our scenario, all purchasing is handled by an ERP system. Well, what options do we have? Maybe there's an adapter between the mainframe platform and the ERP system. Maybe we can instruct the mainframe to send a file by FTP to the ERP system. Maybe there's a message queuing infrastructure that we can use to send data back and forth between the ERP system and the mainframe. So if these were the only two systems that we needed to be concerned with, we could probably choose amongst a few different options. Now when the ERP system looks at the request for the order and it determines that this order needs to go out, it is going to send that to a fulfillment application. So the fulfillment system will go about acquiring the product or material that's required. And when it completes its task, that particular inventory item will be back to acceptable levels. So for the purposes of this discussion, we'll assume that the fulfillment application is running on a Windows platform and the ERP application is running on a Unix box. So if this were the scenario, we could probably cobble something together Along the way, we're going to encounter those difficulties that we talked about a few minutes ago. Well, how can BizTalk help us out? So if we add BizTalk to this scenario, we haven't changed the fact that our inventory app, our ERP app, and our fulfillment app all run on different platforms, and they all expect data in a different format. But BizTalk does offer some pretty important features that help make life easier in that regard. For one thing, when we're developing these integrations, one thing, we can target BizTalk Server as our development platform, since it offers the greatest likelihood that we will be able to reuse some of the components that we develop. Once we've been able to solve the problems of getting BizTalk to communicate with the inventory app, and then we've solved the problems related to getting BizTalk to communicate with the ERP app, and then with the fulfillment app, 
those are done. Once you have that done, now the systems can communicate with each other through BizTalk. And when you add a new system, you're just dealing with linear growth. Unlike the old scenario in which the systems were communicating amongst themselves, when you added a new system in that case, you were dealing with exponential growth in complexity. So of course, anytime we can reduce the complexity of a system, it's just going to make it that much easier to estimate new applications and modifications for that system. And if we can minimize modifications to each of the systems as they integrate with BizTalk, that will only simplify our deployment tasks. If we develop a set of scripts or a common process for deploying applications to our BizTalk environment, that becomes very predictable. Since all of this information is going to be passing through BizTalk, if we take advantage of BizTalk's business activity monitoring capability, we can rely on it to provide accurate reports. With all of the integrations taking advantage of the common components and tools that BizTalk offers, it should be easier to make modifications to these integrations. And the more that we can encapsulate the complexity of these integrations within BizTalk, the easier it will be to create a set of common operating procedures. Once we've installed BizTalk, tracking comes for free. It's built into the foundation of BizTalk. And once we've become confident with our integration between these systems, it might not seem so intimidating to start connecting with systems owned and managed by our trading partners. So with BizTalk sitting in the center helping coordinate this business process, the inventory application can now submit its request for an order to BizTalk. BizTalk has a number of communication adapters that it can use to communicate with a mainframe. And if the mainframe submits a flat file, BizTalk is able to take that flat file and convert that to XML. And it can use that XML to create a message in the format that the ERP system would understand. BizTalk offers a set of adapters for integrating with particular ERP systems. Or you may choose to use one of its more fundamental adapters such as the HTTP or FTP adapter to communicate with the ERP system. Once that connection is established, BizTalk can send that message. And when the ERP system has processed that request for an order, it can submit the order back to BizTalk. BizTalk can take that message and reformat it and turn it into a web service call that it sends to the fulfillment application. At each step of the way, BizTalk was tracking the progress of this business process. And that tracking information is readily available to any system administrator who has access to the BizTalk server. So that was a pretty simple scenario. We only had three systems interacting. So at this point, you might be asking, well, what if the scenario becomes more complex? What kind of support does BizTalk offer for more complex business processes? Well, that's exactly what it was designed to handle. And this diagram shows a purchasing process that we are going to revisit in Module 9 and look in detail at the ways in which BizTalk can help us manage this process. The two features that BizTalk offers for this type of automation are its orchestration capability and its business rules engine. In this case, you could develop a BizTalk orchestration to manage the communication between all the parties shown in this diagram and to store all of the information that's required to fulfill a particular order and to route those messages and deliver them to the right place at the right time. And the BizTalk orchestration could manage all of the details required to process that order, even if it took days or weeks or longer to fulfill that order. And if you could provide a set of business rules that would allow BizTalk to automatically approve certain types of orders, you could expedite this process even further. Okay, well, so far so good, but how is BizTalk getting this information from one system to the other? How can it speak these different protocols and transform this information? And how can it govern these complex processes? Well, let's take a look at the components that make up a BizTalk application, and we'll step through the sequence. 
So at a high level, BizTalk is simply going to take a message, pass it through a business process, transform it, and deliver it to the destination system. But there are a number of components, of course, that work together to make that possible. So they're organized something like this. BizTalk is going to accept that message through a component known as a receive port. This receive port is really a container of other components. At a minimum, a receive port is going to contain at least one pair of components known as a receive adapter and a receive pipeline. These two taken together are known as a BizTalk receive location. You'll hear that term come up later. The receive adapter is responsible for the communication link with the system that's sending the data to BizTalk. This receive adapter might be accepting a message over the HTTP protocol. Or it might be a receive adapter that knows how to communicate with an ERP system or a database system in its own native protocol. All adapters communicate with BizTalk the same way. The adapter is going to create an instance of an object that represents the message it just received, and it's going to pass that to another component known as the receive pipeline. The receive pipeline accepts the stream of bytes coming from the receive adapter and it can perform pre-processing on the message before it goes any further into the BizTalk environment. It might, for example, perform decryption, or it might validate a digital signature. It might even examine the contents of the message and pull out significant bits of data. Once the receive pipeline has finished processing the message, it's going to pass it to a component that's responsible for performing any mapping that is required. And it's going to try to determine if it has a map that it should use to transform this message. In this scenario, for example, we have provided BizTalk with a map that knows how to take a flat file that it received from Contoso and convert it to our own internal XML format. Once that mapping is complete, that message will be stored. It is going to be stored in a database known as the BizTalk message box. Every message that passes through BizTalk is going to go through the message box. And that's why BizTalk can provide detailed tracking information about any message that passes through its environment. All of that information is going to pass through the message box at some point. Once BizTalk receives this message, it is going to look to see if there are any business processes that need it. When BizTalk finds a business process that subscribes to this type of message, BizTalk will deliver a copy to it. So in BizTalk terms, this would be an orchestration. The orchestration will take that message. It will probably examine some fields on the message. It might even execute some business rules. And then if it determines it needs to forward this information to another system, it will publish a new message back to the message box. And at this point, the BizTalk service is once again going to check to see if there are any subscribers interested in this message. And if it finds one, it will forward a copy. So in this scenario, we have a send port that is going to forward this message to another trading partner of ours called Northwind Traders. The BizTalk service will send this to the send port which will check to see if it is configured with any maps for this type of message. In this scenario, we have a map that converts from our own internal format to a flat file format for our trading partner. Once the mapping is complete, the message will be sent out through a pair of components, the send pipeline and send adapter. And as you might expect, the send pipeline could perform encryption, it could create a digital signature, it might perform compression. And then the output of the send pipeline is passed to the send adapter. And the send adapter then establishes a communication link with the destination system. It transmits the message. And then it closes the connection. So if an error should occur at any point in the processing, BizTalk would retain a copy of this message in the message box. And along with it, it would keep a copy of the description of the error that occurred. So this architecture offers a very consistent and stable environment, but with the ability to customize any of these components, it also offers a lot of flexibility. 
Now, if BizTalk is designed to play such a critical role in an organization, obviously it needs to provide the features and tools to people that allow them to get their work done. So the tools are designed to address three different audiences, one being the information workers or business analysts. These are the people who understand how the business processes work, what the different contingencies are. They understand any business rules that might be involved. And they're also the people that are very interested in monitoring all of the business activity that is passing back and forth between these systems. But while a business analyst wouldn't make use of the orchestration designer to lay out a business process, the orchestration designer does make it easier for an analyst to understand what's going on when BizTalk is coordinating a business process. In the same vein, BizTalk offers a tool known as the Business Rule Composer, and that might be a bit too technical for many business analysts, but it does make it easier to read the business rules that a developer has created. The tools that are included with BizTalk that will probably be of most interest to a knowledge worker or business analyst are the business activity monitoring tools. BizTalk provides an Excel add-in that a business analyst can use to specify the data that they would like to see collected as a business process is executing. A developer, of course, the tools that are required to actually create a business application. So BizTalk provides them with the tools that they need to automate these business processes. It provides the tool known as the orchestration designer. So the developer could take the specifications from a business analyst and then create the BizTalk components that are required to implement that process. Now, in order to make it easier for the developer to communicate with the business analyst, the BizTalk developer tools make use of graphical designers. Now, typically a developer, of course, is going to need to write some lines of code to implement any sort of BizTalk application. But the graphical designers make it easier to explain what's going on at a higher level. Then obviously once an application is developed and deployed, and at that point system administrators will need tools to handle the deployment. So BizTalk Server provides a tool known as the BizTalk Administration Console, and that tool provides administrators with a means to configure and manage environments and deploy applications. And then BizTalk also offers some command line equivalents, so it's possible to script common tasks. So BizTalk Server 2010 comes in four different editions. Well, which one's the right one? Well, obviously that depends on your requirements. I'm going to go through this list from the bottom up. So the first one to talk about is the developer edition. So the keyword here is free. This is available as a download from the Microsoft website. And you can use it for development and testing purposes. And it contains all of the features of the enterprise edition. And I'll say more about the Enterprise Edition in just a minute. The next edition is the Branch Edition. So this is what you would need if you had a remote location or a branch office that needed to communicate information back to your main BizTalk group. It includes all the network protocol adapters, the HTTP and FTP adapter, for example. And it will make use of up to two processors. But you'll need to group all of your components into a single BizTalk application. And that might make certain system administration tasks a little bit tedious. The next step is the standard edition. This includes not only all of the network protocol adapters, but it also includes the application adapters. In other words, the adapters that know how to communicate with a particular type of system, maybe an ERP system or, or database system. This one offers more flexibility in grouping your components together. You can group them in up to five different applications. And that will make deployment tasks easier. It will make it easier when a system administrator needs to disable a certain integration. They can just stop or start an entire application and treat the components as a whole, rather than having to go in and pick and choose individual components that need to be enabled and disabled. And like the branch edition, it will take advantage of up to two processors. And if that meets the needs of your integration environment, that's probably the way to go. As you might expect, the Enterprise Edition offers the broadest capability. 
Like the standard edition, this includes all of the application adapters and all of the technology adapters. There is no limit on the number of applications, so you can group your integration components however you please, whatever makes it easiest to manage those integrations. And finally, you can scale it up to more powerful hardware than you could with the standard and branch editions. So now that you have a sense of what BizTalk Server is and what it has to offer, let's take a couple of minutes to focus on BizTalk Server 2010 and the improvements that it offers over previous versions of BizTalk. Some of the improvements are related to installation and setup features, support for sysprep, for example, and clustering. BizTalk Server 2010 offers some improvements in the developer tools, such as the new mapper, there have been improvements in the BizTalk Administration Console, which helps system administrators manage configuration settings and perform database tasks. The BizTalk Administration Console also provides a new user interface for the new Trading Partner Management System. And then there have been improvements in the FTP adapter, in particular the security features that it offers. And the application adapters have been updated to support the latest versions of the applications. And I'll close by covering a few points that you need to be aware of if you're planning to upgrade an existing BizTalk Server installation to BizTalk Server 2010. From BizTalk 2004 through 2006R2, it was notoriously difficult to create an image of a BizTalk installation and replicate that on other machines. And that becomes really important if you want to start using a virtualization environment such as Hyper-V. And the reason that it's so difficult is that after BizTalk is installed and configured, it stashes away a copy of the machine name in a number of different locations. And most people treated it as an impossible task to be able to find all of those references and update them. Now, quite honestly, BizTalk 2009 included a set of scripts in the SDK under the admin folder that provided the instructions that were required to update a BizTalk installation after sysprep had been run. It's just making the headlines now in BizTalk Server 2010 as an officially supported feature. I mentioned earlier that BizTalk Server 2010 supports clustering. Now, talking about clustering, you've actually been able to use Windows clustering in BizTalk Server installations in the past. So the fact that you can install BizTalk Server on a Windows cluster is not new news. The, the big news here is that you can now take advantage of the new features available in Windows Server 2008 R2 clustering. The clustering support that Windows 2008 R2 offers really is pretty amazing. It supports multi-site clustering, so you now can have servers at different geographic locations all participating in the same cluster. So not only does that help you achieve high availability, but you're also getting automatic disaster recovery. So you're no longer bound by the network restrictions that you had to work with in previous versions of Windows clustering. And by moving to 2008 R2, you can take uh, advantage of a number of other improvements in the Windows clustering. But in order to do that, you'll need to be installing BizTalk Server 2010. BizTalk Server 2010 includes some improvements in the developer tools as well. In particular, there have been some really significant improvements in the mapper. If you've worked with maps, to any extent in the past, you'll really appreciate what the new version of the mapper has to offer. The previous implementation of the mapper supported cut, copy, paste, and so forth, as well as search, to some extent. But those functions have been improved significantly in the newest version. And the new mapper makes it a lot easier to navigate your maps and focus on what you need to see. You see the BizTalk WCF Service Publishing Wizard listed here. It actually is the same publishing wizard that has been available in previous versions of BizTalk. So the news in BizTalk Server 2010 really is, is that it has taken center stage. And the old Web Services Publishing Wizard is no longer available. Well, it actually is. There is a way to get to it through the WCF Service Publishing Wizard in BizTalk 2010. 
but you wouldn't want to use that in new development typically. It's just there for backward compatibility. BizTalk Server 2010 supports a scenario in which you can use certain BizTalk components outside of the BizTalk runtime environment. If you are using Windows App Fabric hosting services to host a WCF and workflow application, you can make use of the BizTalk mapper and the BizTalk line of business adapters within your application. If you've never heard of Windows App Fabric, App Fabric is a set of extensions that you can add to your server if you've configured your server to run under the application server role. In short, App Fabric Hosting Services extends the capabilities that are already offered by IIS and the Windows Process Activation Service. So IIS continues to provide the process that hosts your application. And then App Fabric Hosting Services provides some additional management features that make it easier to work with your app. App Fabric actually provides a dashboard that you can use to manage your app. And it allows you to do things like view the runtime status of your WCF services. You can use the dashboard to stop and start a WCF service or to manage the configuration settings for that service. Suspend a workflow or resume a workflow or even terminate a workflow. And you can even use the dashboard to view historical data. So that probably sounds like there's some overlap between BizTalk and App Fabric. And there is to some degree. So you might say that Windows App Fabric provides a subset of the features of BizTalk. And then BizTalk Server 2010 allows you to share its mapper and line of business adapters with the App Fabric runtime environment. And one other point to make note of is that BizTalk Server 2010 no longer installs the BizTalk Explorer in Visual Studio. And that's because the BizTalk Administration Console now implements all of the features that were provided by the BizTalk Explorer. And it has gone ahead and extended some of those features as well. And so finally, one of the other improvements that's sort of inherent here is that BizTalk Server 2010 is built on the .NET 4.0 framework. And so if you need to write any custom components, you can take advantage of the latest version of the framework. Now, when we start talking about the deployment and management improvements in BizTalk Server 2010, one of the first things worth mentioning is the new BizTalk Server Settings Dashboard. In the past, if you needed to modify a configuration setting to improve the performance of your BizTalk environment, you would need to look in any of a number of different locations. You might have to look in the registry, or depending on the setting, it might be in the BizTalk Service Configuration file, or it might be in the Management Database, in which case you should be able to find it in the BizTalk Administration Console. Needless to say, it could be kind of time-consuming trying to locate that information so that you can make the change. Well, in BizTalk Server 2010, all of that configuration information is now presented to you through the BizTalk Server Settings Dashboard. So you can go into the BizTalk Server Administration Console and you'll find a page that presents these settings to you in one convenient spot. And once you have the configuration nailed down, you can export those settings to a file, take that file to another server, and import them there. So that makes it a lot easier to maintain consistency across your servers. Some of the other improvements that you can take advantage of in BizTalk Server 2010 actually originate in the latest version of SQL Server. So SQL Server 2008 supports compressed backups. So as you're backing up your BizTalk databases, you can take advantage of that compression. And it also supports encryption, so you can take advantage of that as well. BizTalk Server 2010 does include a new SQL agent job that will scan and monitor all of the BizTalk databases looking for evidence of common issues, and it will report those to you if it discovers anything. BizTalk Server 2010 also includes a new System Center Operations Management Pack. And so this makes it a lot easier to view the status of your BizTalk environment. It will display a color-coded status icon for every component with your application, which makes it easy to see if everything is running normally or if there are any problems cropping up. If there is a problem, it will report the error information to you. It also offers some performance improvements over previous management packs in the way that it searches a BizTalk environment, discovering artifacts and how they're related to one another. Another new significant improvement in BizTalk Server 2010 
is that the trading partner management system has been re-implemented from the ground up. The new implementation of the trading partner management system is much more scalable. It's designed to maintain information for a much larger number of trading partners. And it provides a model that's easier to work with when you're thinking about trading partner relationships. So BizTalk Server 2010 no longer makes use of the previous object model. So if you are going to migrate data from a previous version to the current version, you can take advantage of a migration tool that BizTalk Server 2010 offers. One other item worth mentioning is people who are going to be managing this trading partner information quite likely will be business analysts. So BizTalk Server 2010 defines a new role known as the B2B operator role. And if you add someone's user ID to that B2B operator role, they will have access to the trading partner information through the BizTalk administration console, and they won't be able to make changes to any other part of the BizTalk environment. Looking at BizTalk Server 2010 from the perspective of adapter improvements, the FTP adapter now supports secure connections over SSL or TLS. In the past, you had to either use a VPN connection or acquire a third-party adapter to handle secure FTP. It now comes in the box. Another item that frequently came up when people would work with the previous versions of the FTP adapter is that you really couldn't use it when you needed to download files from read-only locations. The previous version of the FTP adapter needed to be able to delete a file after it had read it so that it wouldn't download it multiple times. The new FTP adapter also adds support for atomic transfers in ASCII mode. In previous versions, the FTP adapter only supported atomic transfers in binary mode. And then BizTalk Server also provides a set of updated line of business adapters. If you're going to upgrade an installation of a previous version of BizTalk Server to version 2010, BizTalk Server 2010 setup will automatically scan for previous versions of BizTalk and determine which upgrade it needs to apply. It can support upgrades directly from versions 2006 R2 and 2009. But if you're upgrading a 2004 or 2006 installation, you will first need to upgrade to 2006 R2. Then in your development environment, when you open your existing projects in Visual Studio 2010 for the first time, Visual Studio 2010 will automatically convert that to the new project format. And once that's complete, you can continue working with your application in the new environment. Well, speaking of the BizTalk development environment, let's take a look at that in more detail. So we'll talk about the system and software requirements for installing a development environment for your BizTalk Server 2010 applications. And then BizTalk installs a couple of Visual Studio project templates. So I'll explain what those can do for you. And then we'll take a look at the individual development tools that BizTalk Server 2010 provides. The schema editor, the mapper, the pipeline designer, the orchestration designer. And then of course developers will need to use the BizTalk administration console to deploy their applications to their runtime environments for testing. And then I'll close with a demonstration so you can see what the tools actually look like in Visual Studio. Because of its complexity and the fact that it's a server product, people typically expect that BizTalk is going to require some pretty high-end hardware. But in actuality, it doesn't require all that much of a development environment. In fact, if you have a development environment that provides adequate support to SQL Server 2008, that will easily serve as a BizTalk development environment. Also, a lot of people expect that you will need Windows Server installed on your development environment. You can do BizTalk development on Windows 7 or even Vista Service Pack 2. This list displays the minimum software requirements for installing BizTalk Server 2010. Depending on your environment and the requirements of your application, you might want to enable Internet Information Services. You might want to add SharePoint to this list, either SharePoint Foundation 2010 or you could install SharePoint Services 3.0 Service Pack 2. 
The BizTalk Server 2010 setup guide provides a feature dependency matrix. And so for each feature of BizTalk that you plan to use, you can see what the prerequisites are for your particular BizTalk installation. The setup guide then has a very nice list of step-by-step -step instructions for walking through the BizTalk installation and configuration procedure. In the list shown on this slide, one item to note is that as you're installing Visual Studio 2010, make sure you include the support for C-sharp. And that's because of the components that you develop with the BizTalk development tools will be converted to C-sharp and then compiled into an assembly. Now, of course, you're free to install any of the other languages that come along with Visual Studio as well, but just make sure that you include C-sharp amongst them. Well, once your installation and configuration complete, you're ready to start developing. So Visual Studio provides a couple of different templates to help you get started. I mentioned earlier that Visual Studio supports import of a Bepl document. And in the off chance you have a Bepl document, you can use the BizTalk Server Bepl import template that Visual Studio provides. Point to your Bepl document and Visual Studio will read that in and create a project for you that can help you get started implementing that Bepl specification. More likely though, you will either start with an existing project or you will start with an empty BizTalk Server project. So when you choose the empty BizTalk Server project template, and Visual Studio creates the new project for you, it's going to contain the references to the BizTalk runtime components that you'll need. And when you need to add new items to your project, you'll notice that you can only select from a list of BizTalk component types. And you'll also find that there are some configuration settings that are specific to BizTalk. For example, the name of the database server that Visual Studio should contact if it's going to deploy your application out to the BizTalk runtime environment. When you install BizTalk, it is going to install four different tools in your Visual Studio environment. Each of the tools is designed to create one particular type of BizTalk component. You'll also hear me refer to BizTalk components as artifacts and you'll find that term used throughout the BizTalk documentation. An artifact is simply a component within a BizTalk application. So one of the tools that gets installed is the editor, and this tool is designed to help you create and edit XML schemas. It actually takes it a step beyond that. You can use this same editor to define schemas for flat files. As you edit your schema, it will be displayed to you in a tree view it's far better than trying to create an XML schema by hand. It serves its purpose well. Another tool that gets installed in Visual Studio is known as the BizTalk Mapper. And you can use the BizTalk Mapper to define the rules for transforming a document from one schema to another. You can create links from the source document to the destination document, in which case the values will just be copied over directly. And it allows you to start adding mathematical operations, logical operations, and there's actually quite a feature set that's available to you as you're creating these maps. And we're going to look at those in detail in an upcoming module. Another tool that gets installed in Visual Studio is the Pipeline Designer. So you can use this designer to specify a list of pipeline components that should be used to process a message as it passes into BizTalk or out of BizTalk. The fourth tool that gets installed into Visual Studio is the Orchestration Designer. So this is a very powerful tool that allows you to map out those business processes that we talked about earlier. And then it provides the capability to compile that business process into a .NET class within an assembly. Now BizTalk is perfectly capable of handling untyped messages. If your application requirements are simple enough that BizTalk doesn't need to know anything about the content of your messages, you can configure it to simply pass a blob of data from point A to point B, and it's quite content to do that. On the other hand, if you're able to describe the format of your message to BizTalk, you open up quite a few possibilities that you wouldn't have otherwise. And that is exactly what the BizTalk schema editor is designed to help you accomplish. It provides the means to describe your messages to whatever level of detail your application requires. 
So if you just know the names of the records in the fields of your message, the editor can support that scenario. On the other hand, if you start describing the data types of each of your records and fields in detail, the editor supports that scenario as well. Ultimately, you are really just editing an XML schema document. So any of the capabilities that are available to you through the XML schema specification are available to you through the XML schema editor. You can use the schema editor to define XML elements and attributes within your message, to define the order in which they should appear, which ones are required and which ones are optional, to define which elements may repeat. And then on individual fields, you can specify the exact data type. Any of the primitives that are defined in the XML schema spec are available to you here. And then if you even want to start adding restrictions, the XML schema editor supports that as well. So it's a nice tool. It makes it easy to find your way around an XML schema. And it's even possible, by the way, to use this editor to define the format of a flat file. It does that by adding annotations to the XML schema. And those annotations contain all of the format details of the flat file. You'll get a chance to see that in action in one of the upcoming modules. So you know by now that we can use a pipeline to pre-process messages and post-process messages as they pass through BizTalk. And there are actually a couple of built-in pipelines that come with the BizTalk environment. And so those built-in pipelines might just serve the needs of your application as is. If they don't, on the other hand, you always have the option of defining your own custom pipeline, and you get to pick exactly which components should process your message, and you can configure exactly how those components should process your message. Now, once you've completed your work in the Pipeline Designer, you'll need to deploy your pipeline out to the runtime environment. And once that's in place, when a message arrives, BizTalk will create an instance of the collection of components that you specify, and it will allow each of those components to process the message in turn as it passes through your pipeline, whether it's decrypting or decoding or performing some sort of validation against a schema or verifying a digital signature. So there are a number of components that you can choose from in the toolbox, but if none of those match your needs, it is possible to write custom pipeline components that you can add to the toolbox and then incorporate those into your own custom pipelines. The capabilities of the orchestration designer are already somewhat familiar by now. We know that it provides a visual design surface that we can use to lay out the flow of a business process. And as we add these shapes to the design surface, the orchestration designer is creating a series of instructions beneath the surface encoded in a programming language known as xlang. And then when we hit the build button in Visual Studio, those xlang instructions will be converted into C sharp code. And then it's that C sharp code that gets compiled into a .NET assembly. And then of course, we'll deploy that .NET assembly to our runtime environment. So once we cover the fundamental aspects of developing BizTalk applications, we will be spending plenty of time making use of the orchestration designer and exploring the capabilities that it offers. And then the last tool that we need to talk about is the BizTalk Administration Console. So this is the tool that you will be using to manage your runtime environment. Once you have developed your artifacts, your orchestrations, pipelines, maps, and schemas, and you've deployed them out to the runtime, this is where you go out and configure the application so that it has all of the information it needs to know to start up and begin executing. So this tool allows you to create new application, it allows you to delete applications, it allows you to start and stop applications, it allows you to query and monitor message traffic. So as a developer, you'll probably have full access to this on your own workstation, but your access in a shared environment or obviously a production environment will be limited, if available at all. 
And you'll be using this tool frequently as you deploy and test your applications in your development environment. In this demo, I will open up a BizTalk project in Visual Studio 2010. And then I will open up each artifact within that project so that you can see the various developer tools. I'll open a schema, and then I'll open a map, and a pipeline, and an orchestration. And then you'll get a chance to explore these things further as you work through the lab exercise. All right, so here we are in the virtual machine. I'm going to start by opening this solution for the demo app, and that is an all files demo code module one, and it's demo.sln. And this solution contains one project, the messaging project, and it contains a set of artifacts that define a simple application to process orders that are paid by cash. I'm going to open the file that defines the sales order schema, and schema files end with the .xsd extension. Once that's open, I can right-click on the schema node and then choose to expand all of the nodes in the tree. I'm selecting the customer info node and you can see that when I click on that it highlights the schema definition in the center pane. Now when I click on the residence node it highlights that as well and you can notice in the properties window I can see all of the properties that apply to the residence node. Okay, I'm going to close the schema file, and now I'll go and open a map file. So here you can see the links that map the quantity over and then also map the SKU over to the restock product ID. So this is the same sales order schema that we were just looking at in the BizTalk schema editor. Now notice at the bottom of the mapper grid, there's a second tab here, and I'm going to click on this. Functoids are the little things that you can add to your map that extend the basic XSLT capability, math operations, and so forth. But you'll notice that when I first open this page, that the links extend out of view. So what we can do in the new mapper is simply go click on a node and the mapper will automatically pan to bring in all of the relevant links and functoids that pertain to mapping this store number field. Now over to the left you can see a toolbox and this toolbox contains the collection of functoids that you can add to your map so there's a pretty good selection and so you add those to your map simply by dragging and dropping them onto the surface. The next file to open is a pipeline. So we'll open this pipeline in the pipeline designer. So here you can see the pipeline designer and this pipeline contains two components. And over to the left you can see the toolbox and this contains additional components that you can add to a pipeline. Now notice when I select a component the properties for that component are displayed over in the properties window. So I can configure that component here and assign values according to the needs of my application. And then the next thing to look at is an orchestration. Orchestrations end with the .odx extension. And here you have the orchestration designer. So you can see a design surface. You can scroll around. This orchestration is very simple. It defines a process for handling cash orders. So it simply accepts a sales order message and then maps that to a restock message using the map that we just looked at and sends that out. And then it makes a copy of the sales order message and alters some of the data in the new copy and then sends that out. The orchestration designer has a toolbox as well. You'll see that in the left pane. And this toolbox includes a number of shapes that you can add to your orchestration to define your business process. And you'll see over in the upper right corner, there is a window called the orchestration view. 
And this is going to list all of the variables for your orchestration. So you can see variables when you expand these nodes. So that gives you just kind of a sense of what these tools look like. You'll get a chance to try these out for yourself in the lab.